Okay, I don't know how many people are here, but we're going to start anyway. Today we will not be doing... Hey, hey Bill! Today we will not be doing anything cool. What? No caps, I thought I actually... Well, maybe I let let caps be in. <clears throat> but anyway, as I was saying, we are going to be painting a little bit today. And we are not going to be fast painting like we did last time, where it was a matter of getting as much done as possible. Um, instead, we are going to take these two beauties, if we can get them in, in focus. Come on, little camera. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. <clears throat> yeah, you're right, Bill. I should just remove the, the automat ray rules. Would make it so much easier. Um, for now, I'm just going to see why this isn't focusing. I mean, it should focus. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> I think it's something about where it actually tries to see. No, I mean, Bill, as long as we only have a small group of people that can actually handle a little abusive language, then I think we're fine. But anyway, that's going to be something for a later day. But we're going to be painting Blink Dogs. And I got these from... I can't remember what the, the series of miniatures is called, but it's basically the uh, pre-primed, semi-official Dungeons and Dragons uh, miniatures. So we have one there, and we have another one coming in from whatever dimension it goes through. Yeah. If you're a big time streamer, you are going to be that one day, Bill, Bill sooner than you know. Yeah, it's really, really cool. I've been thinking a lot about what to do with the uh, translucent, transparent part here. And I'm very tempted to either wash it or maybe bring out, I have some acrylic inks. Dig out one of them. And I figured, have, have these ones here from Liquitex. Um, they're really nice. I mean, you have very, very thin a uh, very translucent uh, ink, which would be really fun. Uh, but I'm also a little bit hesitant because I don't want to, to mess it up. It's going to be a pain cleaning it afterwards since if I put too thick layer, uh, too thick layer of paint or too opaque layer of paint on, um, it's probably going to make it impossible to get this, uh, the, the see-through effect. What I could also do is Use the the stuff I used for the base on the Spellweaver from Gloomhaven. Where you can see it, it has some shine to it because it's very, very glossy. But I don't know if you can really see it. Um, at the bottom there, it focuses. No? Well, if it, if it would actually focus, you might be able to see that it's pretty translucent down here. So I painted the base white and then put on some, I don't know if AK or Vallejo, that has some, some uh, Pacific Ocean effect. It's meant for doing large scale scenery, I guess. And yeah, it's has a pretty decent effect because it gets this really glossy and the thicker the layer is, the more opaque it gets. Which means that it might actually be possible to, to, um, Get it semi-transparent in, in some places, but where, for instance, in the um, in the the deep sides, the recesses, it might actually become fully opaque, giving some kind of nice effect on on that. But we are going to start with this little one here, and to make it a little bit easier on myself, I think I'm actually going to start out by gluing them onto bases because 
to make it a lot easier to hold on to them. So we're just going to use some standard super glue for this. Nothing too fancy, but this always gets the job done. So what I like to do is just add a little bit in the middle there. A lot of people will probably have different opinions about how this should be done. Um, I like to do it like this. Like so spread it out a little bit, get it on both surfaces. You can see the the shininess is the glue. And then we can just press it down. Add in a few, a few seconds. That's actually going to be in good enough on its own. And got a nice layer on that one as well. Let's get, get it spread out. And here we go. We have this one here. Now, I'm not going to do anything too fancy on the bases. I probably should. Uh, I might also just leave them for now and, <coughs> and do them a little bit later. But now, colors. We are going to need something to do. We're also going to need some paper. So let's get started now with get. We need some paint. We need to get a wet palette up and running. It's going to be off screen, but it's going to be there lurking. So you can see I've used this a little bit, but there's still plenty of moisture in. Might give it a little bit more water, um, but it is, it's, it adds wet enough. Now, unlike what most people think, wet palettes usually can't stay, at least not at room temperature, for several weeks. You can use it maybe a day or two days in a row, but during that time, it's going to be so much easier to get things done uh, instead of doing either straight from the pot or um, doing it in the these ones, plastic pallets like that one here. I mean, you can get away with it. And if I, I'm doing this here, these two are leftovers from some contrast blending I did. That works far better on the plastic palettes, I think, mainly because blending water into the contrast colors has not worked well for me in the past. Or if I have some metallics that I need to thin down a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, still wet palettes, it's a good idea. Um, if you don't like shilling out, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, how, however much it costs in your local store, um, you can make them yourself by just taking a piece of Tupperware and um, a wet sponge of some kind or basically just kitchen towel uh, you can just use that give it i don't know six eight ten layers and then a piece of baking pa uh, paper on top it should not be the kind you use to wrap your uh, your food for lunch for instance that's not gonna do and it mustn't be wax paper i think it's called in english but normal regular cheap baking paper on top of wet uh, with kitchen towel or paper towel it's gonna work just fine add enough water that it gets completely soaked press the um, the baking baking paper down on top of it um, and then pour off any excess water it's a good idea to have a little bit more water than you actually need but it shouldn't be more than that and I'm going to try something here because we're going to get some music going if we can <clears throat> because I found out that one of my favorite artists is actually allowing people to use his music for free as long as they give him credit which I should definitely do then um, so while I try to get that one set up why don't we do that here <clears throat> okay so 
Bill, really, really quick question in Streamlabs. How do I change the stream information while I am actively streaming? If you have any idea, I would really like to know. Stream manager. Right, so web it is. Thanks, AJ. that and there we go okay so that should be it now that's that's fine AJ um, I'll come join you once I'm done painting here because I want to see you play Borderlands again okay so now we just need to to see for there we go getting closer getting closer to actually having some music on stream um, I got home about an hour before I had to stream and I'm really 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 hungry so I needed to I needed to make some food and then I didn't get ready in time and all those usual crabby excuses so let's just find something nice and hopefully quiet and I'm gonna have to rely on you guys to let me know if it is too loud or just right and if you can even hear it that is gonna be interesting I probably yeah we have some desktop audios I think it's gonna be okay maybe turn it down just a notch No, but I mean, Bill, it depends on what kind of, uh, not what kind, but what music you're playing. Um, and th this guy here, Adrian von Siegler, yes, he would like you to, to pay for his music, but if you're using it, it's especially non-commercial. As long as you give him credit, you're more than welcome to, to use it. And he makes this really good um, instrumental music. It is not as quiet as what I've heard in some of the other streams, but I just like it quite a lot, actually. But, so I'm guessing you can hear it. <clears throat> anyway, on with the painting. Now, what color, color should a blink dog get? If you look in the monster manual, you'll see that the blink dog is actually light brown. But I would like to make mine a little bit darker and then doing some try to do some excessive highlights. I mean this model looks like it will be quite suitable for uh, some dry brush work for the extreme highlights. And Bill can hear music, so that's fine. Is it too loud? Is it too low? I need to place him somewhere. Yeah. We are going for Now, shake your paints, thin your paints. We are going for a par parasite brown to begin with, which should be a slightly reddish, I guess, brown. Mm. 
yeah, I'm, I'm making, making quite a bit of noise when I'm using my paints. I know that, that's because I sometimes like to just slam them into things to get the uh, semi-dried up uh, pigments down into the actual bottle. It's a lot easier than pouring out half of it. So we're going to do that. It is on its own fairly <coughs> reddish brown. Sorry about coughing. Um, the chili I had, or the, the chili fried mushrooms I had, were a bit stronger than I anticipated. So I'm a little, little sore in my throat. Now we're also going to add a little bit of matte medium. Uh, not to say that it is a medium matte mercer we're adding to the mix. Just adding a small bit of medium to, to mix it up, thin it down a little bit. And if I can find it, a single drop of demineralized distilled water. And we just need to mix it all up. And do we have a brush for that? Now, I wrote in the various blobs, blips and blobs I've done for the stream that I will be talking a little bit about role-playing games in general. And I definitely intend to do that while painting this miniature. And the reason I want to talk a little bit about role-playing games is that during the past week or two I've been working on creating a new character for a, a group that I've been playing with for ages, I'm talking 20 years here my regular group and we're always doing silly things like using the wrong um, the wrong rule system for whichever world we want to play in um, we also just sometimes we, we play a lot of homebrew worlds one of them we're, we're playing in now that I'm making character for we're playing the the country that is far away and yet that you're always at war with we're trying to explore that because our game master and us as players want to see what goes on over there and this general setting so far has been that in the main country with a name that's stolen from a, another game so we're not going to mention it here but in that country magic is basically banned you are not allowed to uh, well you are but i'm not allowed i mean you're, you're gonna have the church after you if you show yourself to be magically active and since we're playing in the Earth Dawn system mainly, where everyone are magical active, everyone are adepts. Banned? What's banned? Well, so magic is banned. That that magic, yeah. Sorry, I'm just talking and I'm not always remembering what I'm saying. Um, but yes, magic is definitely not something you should be doing openly in, in that country. Uh, you will get the church after you, you will get everyone after you, um, but of course magically act people still show up all the time, so you need to hide a little bit. And when you're playing inherently magic, magical, magically active characters, then it becomes quite frustrating because basically in the Earth Dawn system all your skills well, you, you have both skills, but you also have talents, and the talents are the fun ones. But they're the ones for the warrior, for instance, that makes makes the warrior float a few inches over the ground and just zooming ahead. Think a little bit like uh, Shaolin monks or the Monkey King, if you've ever watched those shows or, or read the books. Um, but you can't really do that in a world where people frown on magic. Uh, no, your fireball would probably um, get you incinerated because the thing is that if the church does magic, then it's not really magic, then it's just the god who is helping them. So you're probably going to get a lot of fireballs after you if you start doing stuff like that. But yeah, that, that, is, that is good thinking. And then there's the whole political issue with the, the emperor against the church and who has the real power because officially it's the emperor but in reality the church has so much power so it's, it's loosely modeled i guess on medieval europe in in many ways like like so like that 
No, but as I said, the the group we're starting up now, we're playing the the evil. Oh yeah, they're very much hypocrites. As I said, it's very much modeled after uh, medieval Europe. So you're not allowed to use magic, um, but if you can somehow do it and make people believe that it's just whichever deity you <laughs> you belong to in in that region, then it's probably fine. As long as you don't do it too much, and as long as you mainly do it to use uh, whoever is in charge, you know, to, to gain more money and power for them, then you're probably going to get away with it for, for a while, at least. Then if you become too powerful, you're going to be burned at the stake. That is, unfortunately, the way of these things. No, but we, we wanted to explore this world a little bit more. And the, again, the, the other country that there's a perpetual war against and a huge front line uh, that doesn't remove really anywhere. So in many ways, that's World War One thrown in the mix. Um, but there, magic is perfectly fine, perfectly allowed. It's even encouraged to the point where if children show uh, magical abilities, the parents or uh, the family will be given a really nice compensation for that, sometimes in the form of slaves, because not everything is good over there. Um, and then the children are taken to a school where they're treated really well. They're given the best uh, teachers and tuition that they can realistically find. Um, so it's actually a, a good kind of place. It's going to be the, the usual boarding school mess that you will see in, in classical stories and so on. That's, that's just people being people. Um, there will always be conflicts of some kind. But generally speaking, they're actually being treated really well because this country has realized that the magic, you know, being as powerful as it is with people shooting fireballs out of their asses, like Falsman does, um, then it might be an idea to actually look into it and, and promote it and make sure that people, if they are found to be magic, uh, magically active, then they actually come to the schools and, and show themselves instead of just hiding and maybe doing secret societies and underground work and all of that. That would, that would not be good. So, since we're exploring this, I figured it would be most interesting to actually do an active, magically active character. And since this time we're moving away from the Earth Dawn system onto the Shadowrun system, this has actually made it really possible to make a really, really silly character concept, uh, rules-wise at least, something that makes no sense whatever, whatsoever, but it will hopefully be fun to play. So I'm basically doing someone who knows a little bit of everything. Uh, and this is where the part I want to talk about with role-playing games today uh, comes into play, because the Shadowrun system does not feature classes, it does not feature levels, there's no such thing as multiclassing or taking a level in Warlock like people are very uh, happy to do in, in d and I've found. But what you have instead is you basically just have a ton of skills. And then you have your attributes or stats or whatever you call them in, in your favorite game. Um, things like strength, uh, it's called quickness, not dexterity and, and so on, willpower, blah, blah, blah. And then you begin uh, the game by creating a character and you have a certain number of points. I think the, the standard number to use according, <coughs> sorry, according to the rule book is 123 and that gives you quite a lot of option for creating characters that are not newly started. Because another concept with Shadowrun that actually make, makes it a little difficult for especially new players to get into is that you don't start out at level one, as you do in D&D, or as you do in Earth Dawn, as you do in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, as you do in many other things. You don't start out at the beginning of your, your career. You actually start out in the classic uh, Shadowrun setting as Shadowrunners, that's where the name comes from, who work outside the law, either with industrial spionage or assassinations, they can be gangbangers, they can be what whatever ill-reputable 
kind of character you you can think of that's that's what they are they are the people who live in the shadows and do all sorts of crazy missions usually just for the money it's not about saving the world well it, it can be of course it can be your, your setting can be whatever you want it to be um, but if you look at a lot of the the classic shadow settings it is basically you being hired to do some kind of nasty job that no one else wants to do, like breaking into a facility to steal the latest prototypes from as technology or whatever, and delivering it to whoever is paying you. You don't look back, you don't care about what it's being used for, uh, you just know you're gonna get your money, and if there are a couple of security guards, well, they should know not to mess with runners. If they do, they'll like to just either die or maybe disappear. So it's a really brutal setting in many ways. It's set that the timeline is kind of fixed at, I think, 62, 63 years ahead of us. So over time, since I started playing it in the 90s, the world has progressed some 20, 30 years. And they actually, they've done a good job of of moving forward um, but I'm digressing a bit because that's the setting of Shadowrun that's not what I want to talk about I want to talk about the Shadowrun system the system as I said is classless so you don't make a warrior you don't make a mage you don't make a hacker or decker as they're called in in this particular one your computer uh, specialists what you do instead is that you just make the character you want to play you make the, the stats, is it a large bulky troll walking down the street and making everyone afraid? Are you playing a nimble elf? Are you playing a um, strong handsome orc? Are you playing whatever, you, you name it, we probably got it. So to do that, you then just decide on your attributes, your statistics, stats. Then you go for a bunch of skills, and if you want to play a mix of things, you just, at the beginning, out of those 123 points, you choose to say, hey, I want to be a magic user, and would you want to be a spellcaster? That's going to cost you a certain number of points. I think it's about 25 points or so. Don't hold me up on, on the numbers. Um, I've not looked much into the, the rules side of this yet, and besides, it doesn't really matter. So let's say it costs 25 points. You activate magical abilities in your character and you get a certain number of points to buy your spells. And that's it, you're now magically active, you now have about 98 points left. So you want to pour some, some things into your stats, let's say you spend another 40 or so points on that, seems about right, you now have 58 stats, there are 58 points left. And with those points you can buy whichever skills you want. A classic theme as a character or concept that goes all the way back to when I was playing with my friends in high school many many years ago back in the mid 90s early 90s it was very common when you did a mage you also bought up your shotgun skill and took a full automatic shotgun because what are you gonna do if you run into people where your magic isn't really working or you basically just need to scare off people you point a shotgun at them, pull the trigger. That's going to be really effective. And you can do that, because there are no rules saying that you're not allowed to wield a shotgun when you're using magic. There's no rule saying that you cannot use a shotgun until you're level 10. There's no rule saying that you need this and that prerequisite. You basically just buy the skill. So yeah, there is that rule. Except you can default to your stats, but it helps to have the skill but once you have it, you just pick up your shotgun and go shooting. And I think that's a really, really good way to make uh, very fleshed out um, characters. Because it's not about choosing an art type or choosing a career track if you want. It's about designing exactly what you want to play. Imagine if you actually wanted in D&D to play a barbarian that casts spells. Sure, you can do that. You can either start as a barbarian or as a wizard, a sorcerer, any of the spellcasting classes, um, and then slowly work your way up, take a level here, a level there. 
But what you can't do is, but you cannot from the beginning say that I want some of the fighting skills from the Barbarian, but I don't want the hit points. I just want the fighting skills and the bonuses from that. I want the weak um, hit by from the Wizard or maybe the Rogue, because you want, actually want to create Conan, who I believe was actually labeled a thief um, way back in the day. And then, um, yeah, then you, you maybe want the spellcasting abilities of a sorcerer, and you just want to mix all of that together. And sure, you can try to make your own homebrew classes for, for all of this, but it's going to be a pain to sit down because you have to design all 20 levels of this new class. Then you have to convince people, uh, especially if you're more um, going for, towards the board gamey style of, of playing where it, it sorry I have to focus a little bit on this miniature to not paint in the wrong places um, if people are, are playing you know, according to the rule and yeah, yes but it is very interesting it's it's also it's not easy to make characters um, because just imagine in in D, &D 5e where you choose your race you choose your class um, and then you choose your background and then you're off and even that can be a little bit daunting for, for new players. I've seen that firsthand and know it from other people. And even you know, when, when looking at it with a few decades of experience from various games, I went, okay, so they've, they've fleshed out the basic D&D system a lot with these backgrounds. It's a, there's a lot of things to look at with feats and skills and all that. But imagine that everything is just open. Um, including the, the final thing that I haven't mentioned yet which is which is an edge and flaw system you can buy i think any number of edges and flaws edges will cost you points flaws will give you points so if you buy i think it's called quadripolitic where you're basically paralyzed from the neck down that is going to be a very real hindrance but it's also going to give you extra points to maybe buy more magic points so you can get more spells or buy some uh, edges so you improve some of your statistics so you can cast even more powerful spells without blowing up your brain uh, you know, all, all those kind of things so it, it balances out you can buy um, buy ambidextrous as a uh, as an edge that gives you bonuses if you're shooting with two firearms if you're um, fighting two hand weapon style because basically anyone can pick up two weapons start fighting with them they're just gonna get a bunch of negative modifiers on that uh, they're also gonna get some bonuses but it's without ambidextrous as I recall the rules it you really don't want to do it that do that so but that's gonna cost you some 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 building points because everything costs you building points uh, of the good stuff so so back to what I'm I'm planning on making for this campaign. Since we're going, I'm going all in on the magical part, because I'm playing a still fairly young uh, woman for some reason. She she showed up in my head and turned out to be a woman. Then that's what she is, and I wanted to have someone who was a little bit all over the place, like I am. You know, lack of. Um, it's called that lack of concentration. What's it called? Lack of concentra concentration. That's absolutely correct. And basically, just wanted to see what would happen if I did that. So we've made a slight modification to the rules because normally you choose one type of magic that you can use, and that's it. Either you're a scholar, um, and then you cast your magic from you know, what you've learned from books and at university and, and all that. Um, or I'm um, drifting way off camera here sorry about that or um, you can take the shamanic uh, direction and then you have your, your totem spirit animal or some of the forces of nature you can have the sun uh, as your uh, totem I don't know if totem make, makes sense for that so they, they, they're pulling that into, into play uh, and the reason they're using the shamanic um, part ties in with their their world story which deals with the Native Americans 
finding their old magic when magic awakens in the world and reclaiming more than half of the North American continent. Um, I don't think North America has a continent, but that, that part up there, including most of Canada, Bill. That's actually Native American country in, in Shadowrun. Really awesome, great, great place to be um, as long as you're not polluting and doing nasty stuff because these these people are very serious. They have some really powerful mages, shamans, and so on. So what I'm trying to, to do with my, my character here, I'm, I'm playing around with the stats to make, again, this building points uh, equation uh, work out for me, is that I want to make one who's magically active. We made a small house wheel, as I said, where we can actually choose to both have one type of magic and the other. So I want to do that because that gives me access to spells in general. It also gives me access to summoning elementals, which are usually um, associated with the uh, sort of scholarly um, ceremonial uh, magic users. What you learn at university, that's going to be sort of cost and effect. But I also want her to be able to summon spirits. And spirits, as opposed to elementals or nature spirits, are some you you don't have make a lot of preparations. You basically just walk around uh, the countryside. You're out in the forest, and all of a sudden, hey, this blink dog attacks you because even though blink dogs are lawful good, it's going to attack you because you're definitely not lawful good. Um, then you just more or less snap your fingers and pull out whatever spirit of the forest you can find. Then that spirit is going to show up and do your bidding for a while until it disappears. So I wanted to be able to do that. I also want her to be able to actually summon full-blown elementals which are a lot more powerful but require um, a lot more preparation to, to summon. I also wanted to be able to cast spells. So she's also a spellcaster and I want her to be able to have the final kind of magic that is at least to, to me was very, very unique when I heard about that in the Shadowrun system when I first started playing it. And that kind of, of magic is what they call a physical adept. And physical adepts are people who's, who have special powers, not spells, but just they're twice as fast as your normal human. Uh, that, that's an, an adept power. Maybe they can see in the dark, that's an added power. Maybe they are, have super strong senses so they can smell and see far better than any human alive. That is all the, the physical adept uh, track of magic. I also want to be able to do that. So all in all, that really, really cost a lot of these building points. Um, but I think it's possible to do it. I mean, it's it should be. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I'm playing with. But getting back into the uh, Shadowrun system made me realize how much I've been missing these kind of uh, systems where you actually kind of roll your own character completely. You don't choose a level, or just sorry, choose a class and then you're locked into that. Maybe you can multi-class but in D&D, you're still gonna have you know, the level, if you take one level in one class and then another level in the second, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. Here, all the skills just cost the same. If you want to improve a skill, it's based on what level you have it and what level you want to increase it to. So basically, you pay a number of points later on in the game to improve your uh, shotgun skill from three to four, for instance, or you improve your spell casting from two to three. That costs a certain number of points and it doesn't matter what your race and what your class and so on is. It's always the same cost to go from two to three in a skill. And that's what I find interesting because it gives you full freedom and you can just pick and choose. Of course, anything you choose, you also actively choose to not take something else. I mean, you, if you're going full on uh, gunslinger, I want to be able to shoot the wings of a fly at two kilometers um, with a laser gun. You're going to need some special skills and your stats are going to have to be 
fairly good and all those things, which is fine because you can build that. You can usually build a lot of it from the beginning. Um, but if you want to do a jack of all trades, <clears throat> if you want to do um, someone who can both shoot sniper rifles, think ranger, and um, cast fireballs, and be really good in close combat with a sword, you can build that. There are of course some limitations and you have a certain number of building points, but you can make the start of that character and then you can improve on it as you go along. So, so those kind of systems, um, I really like them. So, but we also here to paint a little bit of miniatures. So that went pretty well. So let's go for some ink. Let's go for some shade because we want to. Now I do have quite a mix of different brands over here. But what I tend to go back to mostly with inks of shades is actually armor painters because I really like them. And since I want my, my blink darks to be really darkly uh, shaded, I'm gonna go all the way down into a dark tone to make it almost but not quite black. Um, let's see what we can find here. Okay, a few drops of that. And just gently sh shade it. Start with the brain. Uh, start, yeah, let's start with the brain. No, let's start with the head. I think that's, that's where we start because otherwise we'd have to crack open the head to get to the brain. And I think my players would be really sad because this particular blink dog is actually one I'm painting for a 5e group that I'm running where they've been, well, they, they, they made a deal with a not too kind deity that involved them transporting a blink dog from one end of the forest to the other. And my players being wonderful people and the characters being perhaps somewhat naive, they agreed to this, uh, not realizing that the, this Blink Dog was in the middle of a growth spurt. So this small 15 kilo um, puppy, yeah, small and 15 kilos don't usually go well together, but he grew one or two kilos per day to begin with and just outpaced them, ate all their food so they had to go hunt for more and all those things. That was quite nice. But again, I mean, they, he, he took to them and there's some there's a lot of uh, world building, world background as to why that makes sense. So if you're sitting out there wondering why the hell I as a DM allowed my players or my group to effectively run around with a blink dog who's on their side, it makes sense. Try, just trust me on that one. I sent me a message and I'll go into more detail. Um, I, I can't at the moment because some of my players may be watching this lurking in the background waiting for me to spill the beans on what goes on but I'm not gonna make it easy for them they know that by now but anyway that is why I really want to make this blink dog pretty decent to look at and that's also why I don't want to crack open its head because they're gonna be really sad if I do that to their little pet So yeah, but again, back to the, the Shadowrun thing. Um, doing this kind of all over the place magician means that it's gonna start out incredibly weak. I mean, I can do most things really badly and nothing really well. Um, I don't plan on taking any combat skills, for instance. So if we do run into something where I need to pick up a sword and fight something, this, this is gonna be in a fantasy setting, by the way. So. We're tweaking the rules a little bit and of course forgoing all the, the firearms and stuff like that. But I think it's going to be fun also because the way we usually play in, in this group and what I'm trying to, to do in other groups as well, 
is that it's more about the storytelling than it's about the board gamey style of game master versus players. So I'm not trying to build a character that can throw anything, um, that, that, that can survive anything that a, a, a game master is expected or allowed to, I guess, to throw against a level this and that party. Uh, we're doing it the other way around. We, we're looking at what can the characters do, and of course it has to be a little bit exciting. We like the the uh, uncertainty of dice rolls, but what we don't like is the min-maxing your character because that's the only way you can stay alive. Five. It's been a long time ago since we played that last. Um, I like. I mean, I, I mean, I like you know the min max uh, challenge you can have, but then I prefer to do it in a board game where you have a more sort of fixed setting. Uh, go play Descent. Go play Imperial Assault. Go play any number of other games. Uh, I'm sure uh, Gloomhaven comes to mind. Um, I'm sure there are others where you actually need to, to focus on that because there you have a, a completely different setting. But for me, role-playing games is about playing a role. Uh, it's, it's not about following the rules. It's not all the time. It's not about going all in with um, maximizing all your stats and abilities so you're effectively immortal at some point. It's way more fun to, to play to the personality of your characters and have that cause problems. Because in my experience, that can cause far worse problems than you're ever going to run, in, run into when it comes to just a bunch of monsters. Um, <clears throat> I remember reading when I was a kid back in the, oh well, a long time ago, I read in, I think it was Dragon Magazine, an article. We didn't have a lot of uh, those kind of magazines here in, in Denmark at the time, at least I, I didn't know where they were. But I read the article called Bad Guys You Love to Hate. And that article has just stuck with me for 20 years. The reason it has that is that it taught me that your bad guys shouldn't die. Not that it should be immortal, but it is so much more frustrating and gives so much more possibility for long-term game if, uh, plot, plot lines if the bad guy survives. It shouldn't be, be easy for your bad guy to, to survive. Uh, they should have a really hard time getting out of that. And the, the players should actually have a, or at least feel like they have a, a decent shot at taking down the bad guy. But then somehow they just escape anyway. And they live to come back another day to annoy the players, the characters they're playing. And that means that you build this whole um, repertoire of bad guys, of people, of NPCs that don't really, that, that just grows. Uh, once in a while, yes, a bad guy will eventually die or be so defeated that it's sort of out of the out of the mix but until then any of them can show up at any point to make the character's life uh, miserable or just exciting and that is something i think is is missing in many of the the published model modules i've seen in, in various game systems because it all comes up comes down to the whole we need a resolution we need to fix this we need to find a winner uh, pretty much follows the the Hollywood everything has to, to end on a on a high note and a happy ending and all is well and the heroes have saved the day yeah that's all fine and you should have that once in a while but you should also have this oh dang he got away and in many ways I find it slightly painful to say that one place where I've actually seen this work in a fairly recent movie or set of movies was in the Fast and Furious where one of the bad guys actually survives and then his brother comes in and they have to do fight him and the original bad guy is thrown into the mix as well at some point so it's it actually has some continuity it's not just 
oh, new movie, new enemy, new movie, new enemy. And that's what I prefer to do in role-playing games as well. Like my uh, 3.5 D&D group that I'm DMing for, they, in the last section, I don't know if they're listening in on this, but I, I mean, doesn't really matter. Uh, they either know or will be very, um, very soon they'll guess it. They're running around, down in a cave somewhere, uh, doing the usual stuff, looking for treasures, blah blah blah, when they come across this room where a huge battle has, has uh, occurred a long time ago. Um, what they find out the hard way is that one of the people there wasn't actually completely dead, he was just um, trapped inside a circle in the floor that the player characters now, um, with their heavy boots and so on, they actually broke the circle. So they've unleashed this bad guy who was in there. The bad guy got away, He could maybe he could have taken them down, but he didn't really feel up to it because he's been trapped down there for several hundred years. So he wasn't feeling that well, he just wanted to get out. But they do have, you know, this, yeah, that probably wasn't a good idea that he got away but I don't think they really understand the, the, the scope of releasing this particular person back into the real world. But they're going to find out. Not next time we're playing or maybe not even for a few weeks or months. But at some point this character is just going to make so many problems for them. It's still going to be at a level where they kind of know that, well, we can't do much about this. They may just say, well... Who cares? We don't. It's just that's just what happens. Or um, maybe they go, "Oh, we actually have some kind of uh, responsibility to to fix this because we freed him." And then they might actually go go after him, trying to to find him. But I don't know. I guess we'll see over the next couple of weeks and months. But yeah. That was a bit of a rant going in all directions. Um, meanwhile, we've gotten the blink dogs shaded a little bit. Still can't figure out how to get the camera to focus properly. That helped a little bit better. So now it looks really, really dark, um, but that's fine. It's supposed to do that, so we should go into doing um, still wet. We're gonna wait a little bit, and then we're gonna try to do a little bit of layering. Um, so yeah. So, what is up with the rest of you? Are you having a good day? You're all sitting here waiting for Elena to go go online and play Borderlands. Doesn't look like AJ is online just yet, but but let us see when she comes up if we can figure out this. So hey, you're about to start, AJ. So, then I am seriously considering, since this is actually taking quite a long time to dry and I've had a really long day, I think I'm just going to cut it short here at one hour. And then when you're ready, we're going to go watch you have fun. But until you're ready to begin, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about colors because I haven't had a chance to try them yet, but I did buy some new ones. 
this last week here. Um, let's see if we can see them. These are a couple of scale color colors. And I tried them because I've been told that they're fairly... Um, no, you know what? I have my good old trusted test orc over here. Let's try them out. Because I've been told that they're more matte in the finish than uh, Vallejo's or um, other ones. Apparently they're also fully blocked at the top when you get them. So you have to punch a hole. Hmm. Interesting. I've not seen that. Looks like looks like it has a really good consistency, and <clears throat> let's see. Let's try it without thinning. See, so it's not shaking it probably. I can see. But hello, little lark. You are going to get a slightly brownish, green brownish face and faceplate. Okay, so that's fairly thin. Oh. As it is, so this has, I think I may need to give this a far better shake than I've done so far. Um, this is lumpy, goes all over the place in all the wrong ways. So yeah, nope, that is not, uh, that is not a good, that is not a good test. Of these colors. I need to do that in another way at a later point. Now, what you can maybe see here, um, come on, do the camera. I think my camera has problem keeping focus. So as you can see in the chin, the paint is nowhere near even. It just just pushed all over the place and soaks into the recesses. A little bit like some kind of mix between bad ink and bad contrast paint. But who cares? I'm guessing it's because I haven't really given a, a, a good shake. It's probably just been staying on the, sitting on the on the on the shelf of the store for few months, a few weeks, before that it's been sitting in a warehouse and transport and all that. And besides I didn't thin it with water or anything else so I'm gonna do a better test of this uh, really soon. But in the meantime let's see is... Uh, AJ is not all the way up yet. Anyway, we are still going to see if this works. So I'm gonna take us all over to AJ's channel and watch her fall off cliffs. Thank you for showing up. It's been a pleasure uh, sitting here just chatting all by myself. I hope you have a great evening. Bye.
Um, so I want to continue into the depths of Krieg's mind. Um, that is the DLC that I started last time I played. And that would be like weeks ago.